I'm a correspondent for Revolution Newspaper, the voice of the Revolutionary Communist Party, and I'm speaking to our question today from the perspective of the need and the basis for a revolution that will bring about a world without any oppression, without any exploitation of women, of minorities, of people whose society deems different, and so on. But instead of societies where might makes right, which dominate and rule the world today, societies where humanity is consciously and voluntarily transforming itself in the world. If you're not familiar with Revcom.us or Revolution newspaper, I'll apply the picture worth a thousand words method for a very quick introduction. And you will find posters like these as part of what we produce at Revcom. These get shipped by the hundreds into America's prisons, read by dissident intellectuals around the world, and are part of our contribution to the world revolution. So we'll leave that up for a moment. But now I'll go back to <laughs> my presentation. So. Uh, in this light, I'd like to make what I think is a friendly amendment to our topic today. U.S. wars of aggression and Islamic Jihad, which is the greater danger, and I would like to add, to humanity. Because I think a, a big part of the problem that William was identifying is that far too many people in this country, and this affects the movements for social change as well, think as Americans. I remember it having a very profound effect on me as a teenager when I heard Malcolm X say, I'm not an American and got sense enough to know it. I'm one of the 20 million African American victims of America. And I said to myself, I need to find out more about this guy. This, he's on to something. Even as at the time, I found that rather provocative, to say the least. So I think it's an important starting point as we address this question of how to oppose the crimes of our government at a time when it is in conflict with reactionary jihadist forces. I think it's important that we start from the moral standpoint and the fact that American lives are not more important than other people's lives. And I think William made a convincing case that American exceptionalism is essentially what he said, an exceptional record of wars, torture chambers, tyrants, and oppression. Let me take an example uh, that I want to point to. We cannot accept or allow the terms of debate about what the US did to the people of Iraq to be whether or not that was a dumb war or whether or not that war wasn't in the interests of the United States. That isn't what that war was about, and that's not how it should be judged, as William was pointing to. This was not a war to bring the Salvation Army to Iraq or bring any kind of liberation to Iraq. This was a war based on an assessment by at that point, the defining elements of the U.S. ruling class, that they had a moment after 9-11 to tear up the whole Middle East and restructure it in a way that would facilitate their global economic and political and military domination. Now, in many ways, that invasion did end up backfiring on them. But that's not why it was wrong. It was wrong because it brought indescribable misery to the people of that region. William was talking about this, you know, in some of the research I've done for articles about Syria, for instance, uh, for coverage at Revcom.us, there are hundreds of thousands of Syrians driven from their homes. That country has been torn up from top to bottom, and the United States bears the responsibility for that. This is not a dumb war. This is not a war that we should be judging by whether or not it serves US national interest. This is a war of imperialist aggression and a crime. So what country is the greatest threat to humanity? 
we're living in. And we have to take responsibility for that. But if we're going to get to a world without oppression of any kind, I think we need to do more than answer that question. I don't accept that exposing the crimes of ISIS or other reactionary regimes and powers that are in conflict with the United States is, has to be in opposition to calling out and exposing the crimes of our government. In fact, I see this as a package, something that we have to do together. Now, there is a challenge to handle the relationship between that correctly. You can say, well, you know, ISIS is really bad. I'm going to spend all my time exposing their crimes. That would be betraying the people of the world, particularly when you're living in this country. But I think to break out of the current vicious cycle in the world, where every U.S. drone, every exposure of U.S. torture, which is not to get information, but to terrorize the people of many, much of the world, these things then give rise to what people see as the only alternative. And we don't have time to go into this, at least in, in this presentation, but if you dial the clock back to when at least William and I were coming up, there was a different kind of oppositional force in the world. There was revolution and communism on the map in the Middle East that was a positive alternative so that during the Vietnam War, for example, there was a good guy side to root for. And not only was Daniel Ellsberg correct that the enemy was us, but the solution was, and many of us came to identify with and support the Vietnamese revolutionaries, the revolution in China, and so on. Now, since those revolutions were turned around, but that alternative has been both physically off the map and ideologically taken a beating. We have been told for decades now that that is not a possibility, that capitalism is the best the world can do. The person who has done the work to dig into that, to scientifically examine that experience, including why it was set back, to chart a way to advance on that, but in an even more emancipatory way, with a stronger basis in internationalism, with more appreciation for and promotion for the role of dissent in socialist society, for example, is Bob Avakian. And the reason that those of us who are advocates for his new synthesis of communism are so determined to get his work out there is two reasons. One, the world needs a revolution and this is a way it can happen. And two, if we don't lift the ceiling on people's expectations, if people's thinking, radical people's thinking, is confined to the lesser of two evils between Russia and the United States or Iran and the United States, that is not only not going to lead anywhere in the long run, it is going to be a stifling and suffocating influence on the level of resistance to the crimes of our government. It's too much to read on a poster, but I'll read it out loud. This is a quote from Baba Vakian that we refer to as the two outmoded. And what he says is, what he identifies is, what we see in contention here with Jihad on the one hand and McWorld, McCrusade on the other, are two historically outmoded strata among colonized and oppressed humanity up against historically outmoded strata of the imperialist system. These two reactionary poles reinforce each other, even while opposing each other. If you side with either of these outmoded, you end up strengthening both, and I'm going to return to why I think that is. Well, this is a very important formulation and is critical to understanding much of the dynamics driving things in the world in this period at the same time, we do have to be clear about which of these historically outmoded has done the greater damage and poses the greater threat to humanity. It is the historically outmoded ruling strata of the imperialist system, and in particular, the U.S. imperialists. So I've spoken to why I think our 
government poses the greatest threat to humanity, but is it really the case that if you support or are even soft on either of these forces, you end up strengthening both? Well, there's different dimensions to this. One is clearly the actions that, again, I've got to use the air quotes for our government every time I refer to it, it's clearly the case that every time they go into one of these countries like Yemen, which they're doing now through Saudi Arabia, carrying out mass murder with bombings, supporting the most despotic forces, that people turn to the other alternative on the ground, which unfortunately right now is Islamic jihadist, reactionary Islamic jihadist forces. And it's also the case, and we just need to confront this, that when the forces like ISIS are in control of an area, I don't know if anyone's seen this movie Timbuktu, it just brings us to life in a very visceral way, but you know they ban music, uh, as well as imposing very draconian rules uh, from Sharia law on women. So what I'm arguing is that if we re restrict our paradigm to only exposing the biggest danger to humanity and not the whole package, we, won't, we will end up even ironically pulling our punches, metaphorically speaking, in terms of our own ruling class. Let me take the example of what's going on now between the United States and Iran and the debates within the respective ruling classes of these reactionary superpower and reactionary regional power over whether and how to develop their relationship in both of their mutual interests. Who and what does it serve to support Obama's moves to develop collaboration between the US empire and the Islamic Republic of Iran to shore up both of their interests in the Middle East. And by the way, there have been massive protests within Iran against their regime, including large-scale participation of women. Revolutionary communists are in the mix of this. And what I'm posing is, why can't we oppose, and this should be our main task, the crimes of our government while supporting genuine revolutionary resistance and struggle around the world. So I want to conclude by returning to the point that we are living in the country responsible in very direct ways for vicious exploitation and murderous oppression everywhere on earth on a level that no other force on this planet can touch. Not in the same ballpark. We have a moral duty to oppose that, not to democratize it, not to advise it on how to do its work in a more peaceful way, but to oppose it. And that is not opposed to, but there can and should be dynamic synergy between that and wrestling, wrangling, and yes, debating over what will fundamentally get to the root of what's wrong in this world and how to get rid of that. We saw this in the Vietnam era where we stayed up all night, went to study groups, had debates between different trends, and then we were all out the next day opposing what our, our government was doing in Vietnam. And today, if you look around the world in this country, from Ferguson to West Baltimore, if you look at the upheaval around the world, there is every basis to bring forward that kind of movement today on an even more profound basis.